Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you uh, at the FU. Before I get started, I wanted to just uh, share a bit about myself. Uh, and I have uh, Matthew here, uh, the head of the Zen Framework, the new project at Agility, and also Maurice, um, who is one of our lead architects and leads the North America Professional Services Organization. So a bit about myself, I uh, studied computer science at the Technion. I was a pretty bad student because we started, Zev and I started working on PHP in the middle, and that was much more fun than uh, studying. So we barely graduated, but in the last uh, year, managed to actually catch up a bit uh, and finish. Most people don't know that I love Java, and that's probably a surprise to most of you. Uh, this is the creation of Java that I make at home. And uh, this is a real picture. I'm, uh, I'm an aspiring barista, and if, if technology ever doesn't work out for me, I have a second job that I can always go to, which is making good coffee. Uh, I've been involved in PHP since 1997, uh, working on PHP 3, basically the runtime of PHP 3, then the Zend Engine 1 in uh, PHP 4, and of course worked on Zend Engine 2 uh, in PHP 5. And most people don't know, but I actually have four citizenships. So I'm a Swiss-born British mother, moved to Israel when I was 10, and then nine years ago moved to the US. So uh, I, have, I can go into pretty much any country I want, uh, with the different passports. Just a bit about Zend. Uh, Zend was started by Zev Swarovski and myself. Uh, Zend stands for Zev and Andy. Zev's father came up with the name, which is why Zev is the first, and I'm the second. <laughs> uh, as I said, we worked on Zend Engine. We also helped uh, jumpstart a significant amount of other open source <coughs> projects. Uh, Zend Framework is one of them. The other one is Eclipse PDT. And we also contributed to Apache, Apache Software Foundation, a bit on MySQL, and then today we're going to talk about a new open source project, which is Apagility, uh, which we've also uh, started. And uh, what Zen does is we really focus on delivering an application platform for PHP uh, for companies who are using PHP uh, for business critical use, uh, and we'll actually show some of that today. So just a bit of an update on PHP. You've all chosen PHP, so I don't have to convince you too much that you made a good choice. Uh, but PHP today is considered as the Internet English. It's the most dominant language on the web. Uh, there's over 240 million websites today running on PHP. Uh, the low-end estimates by Netcraft are about 39 to 40% of the web runs PHP. Uh, when Google announced PHP support on App Engine, they talked about 75% of the web running PHP. So it's somewhere between 40 and 75 percent, a very big amount uh, of the web. So you've all made a very good choice of uh, actually choosing PHP for what you do. One of the things that a lot of people who are not part of the PHP community don't realize is that PHP is a very strong and mature ecosystem. Uh, not only the applications like Drupal, WordPress, Sugar CRM, Magento, the different frameworks and frameworks, Symfony, KPHP, that are enabling enterprise uh, PHP, but you also have a lot of the large software vendors and hardware vendors around here who basically innovated in PHP. So IBM, for example, uh, has worked with us on DB2, Informix connectivity, uh, power system support, Oracle worked on Oracle database support, uh, MySQL, of course, Oracle Linux, uh, work done by Microsoft on SQL Server, uh, and a lot of other companies have also contributed. So when companies today make a choice uh, for what web development language to use, um, PHP is really one of the most mature and easiest choices for companies to make because it comes with this broad ecosystem. And just to share with you some of the you know, large enterprises have been using PHP, um, you know, companies in France like BNP Paribas has a very large amount of PHP applications internally running on Zen Server. You have uh, France Telecom here using PHP, Jean Damry. You have a lot of very uh, significant PHP usage. Uh, you, you probably know that already, being part of AFU. Uh, but definitely France is on the forefront, one of the most, uh, one of the countries that has the most adoption of open source and PHP. I would say you, uh, America, Germany, and France are probably the top three countries 
on the HB adoption, but it's really everywhere. It's completely global. In the US, we also have uh, companies like Disney, um, eBay, New York Stock Exchange, a lot of very um, famous companies who basically run uh, HB applications. So you've made a very, very good choice. And if everyone ever questions your choice of PHP, uh, you have some statistics now and some information uh, to actually share with them. So what we wanted to talk about today are some of the key trends that we see happening in the market, and then what is Zen doing about those trends. Um, we definitely see that the world is changing. Every industry right now has some level of disruption, uh, driven by mobile, driven by cloud services. And uh, it, that includes some of the industries that are, you know, very far off from technology, but technology is changing them. So, for example, real estate in the in the U.S. and probably also in Europe is starting to ha is starting to change based on mobile first experiences and uh, a very different engagement model uh, with their users. And so, what we're seeing right now is that for companies, um, not only is that change a huge opportunity, but it's also a risk if they don't change fast enough to not only take advantage of that opportunity, but really stay ahead of the competition. Um, and I think that opens up quite a few new challenges for companies on how to do development. And uh, development is much more user experience focused. Uh, you're, you're aggregating multiple services together to deliver a personalized contextual experience you have more issues with performance, for example, because in the past, you could do a lot of caching. Now, every user has his own personalized experience. Everything is dynamic, everything is connected. Um, we're only at the beginning of that, but what we're really seeing is, you know, you're gonna have a huge amount of devices, both devices on humans, devices in the home. All those devices are gonna get connected, and uh, that's gonna, create a lot of new opportunities for companies, it also is going to create risk for companies who are not moving fast enough. I mean, the first, uh, probably the first industry that got hit by this was the media industry that had to move very, very quickly from being paper-based to being web-based. But we're seeing also very, very traditional companies that are uh, in manufacturing or uh, supply chain and so on and so forth, seeing that mobile can give them a very big advantage, a competitive advantage, and they can also see that there's new players coming in who, who can basically threaten them if they don't uh, move fast enough. And so this all leads to a change in development that we're looking at. And you know, everyone has talked about agile development in the past few years, and I would say today that's already pretty much a de facto standard. Everyone is doing some form of Scrum or Kanban uh, at Zen, we do Scrumban, which is a bit of a combination. Um, but agile development is not enough. You can write code and you can write it fast. But the question is, can you really move that code into production very, very quickly at very high quality and have the flexibility to go and connect to different mobile form factors? Can you connect to different services? Um, and are you really building um, an architecture and a process that is going to future-proof your investment. And that's really the, the core thing we're looking at as a company. And uh, we, we basically see this transition from agile development to agile application delivery happening. And for us, agile application delivery is all a question of, from the minute you have an idea, how can you get that idea running in production at high quality very, very quickly? Okay. You, want to, you want to be able to do that in a matter of days or weeks, not in months or years. And that, re that has a lot of different requirements to actually make that happen. And we're looking as a company at really three key areas to make agile application delivery happen. The first one is focusing on building the right architecture. We believe that the world is changing. You have to move to an API-centric architecture. The presentation logic is moving from the server to the client. And only with an API-centric architecture are you going to have the flexibility and to change your application fast enough to get to enough mobile devices and uh, future-proof your development so you're not making an investment today and then have to rewrite your application tomorrow. The second 
um, requirement is continuous delivery. Um, there's a change in people and process to take a line of code, get it into production as quickly as possible, um, but still keep high quality. And we're going to talk a lot more de in detail about that and show some demos, but from our point of view, that frictionless process that has to be highly automated from development and operation to operations is a key requirement to being able to move at a much, much faster pace. And that faster pace is a must-have must pace, so you can really do development that is very focused at the user and at engaging the users you have. And then last, um, we really see cloud as a major enabler to continuous delivery. Uh, cloud gives you automation, it gives you the agility, it gives you flexibility, and in some cases also gives you scale. And if you're, if you're not embracing cloud or at least cloud concepts, it's very, very difficult to move very, very quickly uh, the way we think. So what we've been talking about for the past month, we announced this at ZenCon US, were really three key things. One is Apigenity, a new project to help companies build API architectures the right way. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Second is our, opini our opinionated uh, blueprint on how we think companies need to change their development and operations process. And how do you really get to a world we have continuous delivery. We're able to push code into production much, much faster, but also get to a much higher quality level than you've ever been to. And for many people that may sound conflicting, moving faster and increasing the quality, that's the whole idea of continuous delivery. It's basically saying those things don't have to conflict and it's possible to do that. And then last but not least, We've been working for two years to really deliver a consistent fabric across a number of cloud platforms. And I'll just touch very slightly on which cloud platforms we're supporting and how we think about uh, cloud in the context. So a bit about App Agility. App Agility is a new open source project we started. We announced it a year, uh, not a year, a month ago. Uh, it is the best way to build high quality APIs. APIs are hard. Um, if anyone tells you they aren't, they're lying. Uh, we've worked with very big companies who are doing APIs, who have very skilled engineers like Disney, like Apple, um, using PHP, but they're having difficulties on agreeing internally on how to build the right APIs, how to make them most flexible. And there are issues in addressing topics like versioning, like error handling, discoverability, um, documentation, validation, authentication. There are a lot of things you have to take care of as an API creator to really deliver the right API architecture. And at Zen, we believe there's a big vacuum today in the market that no one has really made it easy enough to take the best practices and the right methodology and make it incredibly simple to build APIs. And I'm not only talking about the PHP space, we looked at the Java space, we looked at .NET, but we didn't believe there was a good way to do that. And we think with App Agility, we can change the game, not only for PHP developers, but for any enterprise developer that wants to move to an API architecture. So enough slides, I'd like to invite on stage uh, Matthew. Matthew is the lead for Zen Framework, and his team has been working in the last few months to basically build App Agility on top of Zen Framework and deliver what I think you're going to see is a really cool experience for building high quality APIs and we eliminate a lot of the headache from you from actually having to figure out how to do things like versioning and error handling and so on and so forth. Are you uh, set up? No. Okay. <laughs> I can keep on talking. <laughs> Anyway, so um, they're working very, very hard at this. Um, it's right now, on, it's, it's open source, it's on GitHub. We have a lot of people already engaging, trying it out. Our goal is to hopefully have a, a, a first version in Q1 uh, of 2014. But you'll see already as Matthew demos it, it already does a lot. And it's leveraging a lot of the capabilities of Zen Framework too. So not only is it a very simple way of building APIs, but it's also a very robust way because it's actually extensible and it, it, it's not a black box. You actually can 
look at how it's doing things and figure out uh, if you need to make any changes. Okay, I'll hand it over to Matthew. Hello again. Uh, the tea for the français, so I'm going to speak in English today. Uh, so Apagility is a new project. Uh, it's different than Zen Framework in many ways, in part because we actually have a web-based interface. Underneath the hood is Zen Framework 2 itself. Well, we have this interface so that you don't have to necessarily know everything about Zen Framework 2. In fact, you don't need to know anything about Zen Framework 2. You install the app and you come to this welcome screen, which invites you to start and create an API. Wait a moment here. The machine's been overloaded the last couple of days. So we uh, jump into the admin interface. We have this dashboard that will come up. On the right-hand side, what you are seeing is the Chrome Developer Toolbar. And I want to show you this because we're making a bunch of API calls as we go. You're not seeing them yet, but as I start making uh, changes within the dashboard, you will see the API calls happening. And this is important because I want you to understand that we're not only advocating API first, but we're developing API first as well as we create this tool. For the demo today, I created a contacts database of uh, Zen Framework team, contributors, community, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm going to first off show, I'm going to create a Zen a database adapter here. I'm giving it a unique name so that the application knows which connection I want to use here. The driver type I'm using is uh, SQLite, but if you look through here, there are a whole bunch of different databases represented. It's everything that ZendDB currently supports. My database is in, let's see if I can spell all this correctly. Actually, let's make sure I've got the right database. <laughs> yes, there we go. So go ahead and save that. We'll get a little message saying that it's been saved. We can actually introspect it and uh, edit it if we wanted to. I'll now create a new API, this button up here, and I say contacts. New API has been created. First thing I want you to notice is it says version one. We do versioning by default from the very beginning. E APIs evolve over time. Sometimes you have to deprecate things. Sometimes you need to add things. Sometimes you need to change things. So we start with version one. I'm going to go into my REST services and create a new REST service. Again, you'll see all these requests are happening on the far right side there. This is a DB connected one. I created this database adapter. It now shows up in this pull down and I can tell it I want my user table. I'll go ahead and create that. It tells me it's been created and we can see it here. The application I'm doing is living in the same uh, web host as my API, so I'm going to go ahead and segregate this. So I need to edit, and I will put in a prefix of API here. I'm only going to show three entries per page because I want to show the pagination features. And I'll go ahead and make it read only. And all of this is just clicking buttons at this point and doing little entries here and there. We want to make this as easy as possible so that you can actually get started and just expose your data right off the bat. We'll save that. The REST service has been updated. So let's see what we have. There's a client called uh, Postman. Is this the right one? Yes. Uh, and this is a really nice client. And, wow, that's really big. I need to make that smaller. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and just request my user. And I'm going to say load that. Uh, it's saying, not fun. did I do the wrong thing here? <laughs> oh, it's me too, that's why. We don't have a version 2 yet. Didn't update this. So, I've now made a request and we can see that I get a nice payload. And if those of you who know anything about REST, one of the things we have here is hypermedia linking. And so I've got pagination links right off the bat saying what the next few pages are going to be. And then I've got the actual elements in here. So we can see all of that works. I can then go and create an application that consumes this API. And uh, in this case, I wrote uh, an application in Angular that simply consumes the API, consumes those links, because with those links, I'm able to discover different areas of the API. And with those links, I'm able to do pagination within the application itself. This is going to come up here. You can see all the stuff happening on the right. And you can say I can page through. 
those links that I'm creating are from the API itself, so I don't need to know all the different pages or anything. I can just follow the links based on what's available to me. And then I can go and uh, take a look. Oh, there's some information there. So in this API, I was just connecting to a database, which is not all that interesting. So I want to do a new version of my API. I'm actually skipping over a bunch of stuff, but we'll, we'll see what happens here. So we have this new version of the API. And if I go to version one now, to my REST services, you'll notice that I can no longer edit the REST service. I can only view it. This was an opinion that we created that says, when you are updating new versions and creating new versions, you want the old versions to continue to work exactly the way they did before. So we shouldn't be changing details about that. So in the API, in the uh, admin interface here, we're saying, you can't edit this anymore. If you want to edit, edit on the new version. That said, everything under the hood is configuration, so you can go and do bug fixes and maintenance fixes and security fixes to your API if you need to. But we're saying within the, and, and the interface itself, we don't want you to go and make changes. We don't want you to be adding new methods, that sort of thing. Going back to version two, I'm going to create a new REST service. Amongst the data that I have there are the Twitter usernames for the people in my contacts. I want to expose their tweets. I could just link to the tweets and go to Twitter, but I want to do it within the application itself. So I'm going to do what's called a code connected uh, resource here. Code connected is probably the best portion of App Agility because it allows you to take what you've already written and expose it as an API. If you have an application written in Symfony and you're using Doctrine, you can go and expose Doctrine all your entities in Doctrine through the code connected. If you're doing something in Zen Framework 1 that's relying on ZenDB, you can actually expose that now through an API, through App Agility. I'm gonna call this one Tweets. I'll create the REST service. It says it's been created. We can see it's updated here. I now have the new service. I'm going to edit this one as well. Just like before, since it's in the same application, I'll prefix, but this is tweets related to a particular user, so I'm actually going to get <coughs> a little bit more information. Because I messed up earlier, I have to change a few other things. Uh, instead of saying tweets ID, it'll be tweet ID. And that's just for consistency, and now we can go ahead and save this. So I've said we want tweets, and what this does is it goes and generates some code, uh, a stub really. And we can take a look at that source code. The entity class, actually this is not the one I want to look at, I want to look at the resource class. This should come up. Uh, it's not coming up, so we can't look at it right now. Uh, I've made some changes in the system right here. <laughs> I was debugging some stuff yesterday and I think I broke a few things. Anyway, the point is, is that we create these stubs and now I need to put the code into there. Uh, I don't want to, don't have enough time to actually show you writing in the code, so I'm just going to go up here and sync it in and magically we have code in there. If I go to Postman at this point, I can go and request version 2. I'm going to do it through the URI. We also allow uh, versioning via the accept header so we can have a custom media type. It's actually set up for you right off the bat. I'm not going to show that because it takes longer to, to demonstrate, but I can uh, go through and say user one tweets and it's going to go and fetch this assuming I've got a decent connection. It looks like it must be fetching. Yes. Oh no, I've got a stack trace. <laughs> so this is the other aspect that we are handling with an app agility is that we are giving you error handling. We do what's called an API problem response, and you can go and grab the API problem, and it will uh, return all the details. It will tell you what kind of problem happened. If you are in development mode, it will also tell you that uh, you give you a stack trace and all the previous exceptions that you had in there. Uh, if we look in here, we can see all sorts of different errors are happening, uh, and I'm not going to try and debug right now. The point is that it actually all of this works seamlessly for you. You don't have to go and learn how do I do error handling. I don't have to try and implement error handling at every level of the application. We're doing all of that for you, wrapping it up and, and sending it back. In the end, I've been able to version an application and I've been able to create a couple of different things. 
The last feature I want to show that I think is probably the most important feature that we did recently is authorization and authentication. I can go into the authorization and essentially say what, ask, what portions of this API do I want to make private? Which ones are going to require authentication? I'm going to mark all of these as get. All the uh, get requests are going to now require authentication. So I can go ahead and save this. And when I go into Postman here, I'm going to fetch just the user. And when I call this, it's going to tell me it's forbidden. I've just made this an area that is non-public that requires authentication. <laughs> However, how do I authenticate? So I'll go back into my dashboard. And if you were paying attention earlier when I did the database adapters, we have this authentication area. I'm going to add basic authentication. We also have digest authentication and OAuth2 available. So for machine-to-machine -machine communication, you can use HTTP uh, authentication. When you're doing mobile applications um, or web applications, you can utilize OAuth2 and have the person put in their credentials, grant access, and do that little dance so that we don't actually have the credentials stored in the client side. It's much easier to demonstrate a, uh, HTTP, so I will do that now. I've got a password file. That I'm going to save. This has been saved. We can introspect that if we want. I can go back into my REST console, set up my basic auth. Username is Matthew, and let's go ahead and do that. I'll refresh my headers. This gives me an authorization header. And when I send this now, it goes ahead and fetches everything. So we have authentication built in. We have authorization that you can do on a very granular level. We have versioning. We have uh, the ability to connect a database connected resource. You can also connect code connected and put in any code you want into App Agility. So this is where we are. We've got a few more milestones going, uh, including input validation and then actually API documentation so that your end users know how to consume the API. So this is a very exciting project for me. It's very fun to see all of this come together. We've done it in a very short amount of time and we give you a first class experience in building an API and exposing your data so you can do these cloud connected mobile applications. Who's up next, Andy? Yeah. So we're running a bit out of time, so I'm going to do the next three slides very, very quickly because we have another demo I'd like you to see. Um, but generally speaking, we're, I talk about continuous delivery. The goal of continuous delivery is to create a very frictionless process from development to operations. It's all about automating all the pieces of the application lifecycle, making development and operations working much better together and much closer, and having consistency from development into operation. Hold on. There we go. And, and one of the key issues today that developers have in getting their code into production without delay is lack of consistency, lack of automation, lack of dev DevOps collaboration. So that's really what we're focused on with continuous delivery. Um, I just wanted to kind of describe what continuous delivery actually looks like. It's basically, think about a conveyor belt from development to operations. So let's say four key focus areas. First one is having a continuous integration environment that doesn't only go to the automation of unit testing, but takes it one step further with packaging, deploying into a test environment, running functional tests in an automated way. So at any point in time, you have a high quality deployable application. The second is being able to uh, automate the release um, and, re and automate it the same in testing, um, staging and production. That's one area we're really focused on is making sure you have a self-contained package, that package can be pushed out, you can roll it back, it, it checks dependencies. Very, very important to get the whole release automation process right. That way you know that you're able to click a button, get, get code into production, and make sure that there wasn't anything that you missed um, when you were doing that. Third is infrastructure automation. So you probably heard of things like Puppet and Chef. Uh, cloud also allows you other ways of automation. If you can automate the infrastructure provisioning and configuration, um, that means you can start 
testing in very consistent environments in the testing environment as in the production environment. And then last but not least, making sure you have good application management where you have visibility into the application that's running in production. Um, developers should have access also, at least some visibility, so if an issue happens, you can close the loop very, very quickly. So I'm going to pass it over to Maurice. Um, Maurice is going to show you an example on how we use Ant Server as the conveyor belt to basically move through the continuous delivery process and how we've automated certain pieces such as Jenkins, such as continuous integration, release automation, and provisioning. And what we've done over the past few months is work with customers um, to build out these continuous delivery environments in their environment. So companies like eBay are using us to do end-to-end -end continuous delivery. And uh, Maurice has already done several implementations of this um, with customers. All right, thank you, Andy. So what I'm going to show you guys today is, like Andy said, our idea of uh, our implementations uh, of continuous delivery. And like Andy mentioned, it really is all about automation. So it all starts with some piece of code that you're writing and that you're going to change. The application that I took today, that I chose today to demonstrate, is a uh, CMS that was actually written based on Zen Framework 2 and very appropriately written by someone in France. Um, so the, uh, what we're going to go ahead and do here is we are going to log into the admin of the CMS and we're going to do a quick code change. And that will set up a chain reaction that will, uh, so I'm going to do a code change and I want to add some information to this panel right here. So I'm going to go into that studio and just go ahead and say, and go ahead and change the version of the application. So of the version of the application that I'm deploying to 1.0.14. And I'm going to go ahead and check my code into, uh, into Git. Now, normally you would not, uh, depending on the workflow that you're following, you would not check into master, but I want to do this a little bit faster, so I'm just going to do that right now. Now, you see, I, I, I checked the code into Git, uh, and this is going to, as I said, uh, trigger a chain reaction in a tool called Jenkins. Okay? For those of you who don't know Jenkins, Jenkins is actually a continuous integration server, and Jenkins automates the process, it's the one responsible in this case, of taking the code from the development all the way to the uh, staging, which is this box right here, by going to the steps in the middle. So right now, I am running my unit tests. So you see I've been running my unit tests for 9.7 seconds, 12 seconds, etc. So it's going to go on up until the unit tests are finished. And every phase that results in a green uh, box will take you to the next phase. Now, one other thing that's interesting here is that I've got three tasks parallelized. So as soon as I know that my unit tests passed, I know that I can move on to the next stage. And I'm actually not, I'm packaging the application, but I'm also doing some code checks, some style checks on my code, okay? And this workflow could be customized, obviously. It's only an example that I'm showing you here. I'm generating some reports. Uh, and part of the release automation process, so how we automate the application. So this up to here was continuous integration. And release automation means getting the application on the server. So you see that application now is going on to staging. And if I look at, this is the Zen server interface, if you see here, the application is actually currently being deployed on the server. Okay, by, as indicated by this little spinner. I'm now in the activation phase of the application. And if I go back into, uh, where, there you go, if I go back into my admin panel and I refresh, you're gonna see that code change that I just did in Zen Studio just appear here. So you saw everything that I was doing during this whole process is actually showing you what's happening. I actually never did anything manual other than checking my codes and it just automatically went onto my server. Which is pretty cool, right? So, um, now that you've got some code running on a staging box, the next logical step obviously would be to take that code into production. Now, our environment in production is a bit different in staging in the sense that I've got a little bit more servers, okay? Uh, so I've got four nodes right now in, in production. So I've got web active one, two, three, and four. All right, so uh, the next step, if you look at this pipeline right here, you see that the next step is deployed to production, but I actually configured it in order to uh, be a manual trigger because I don't want it to happen automatically because I want to do some tests and staging. I want to be able to make sure that I have user acceptance tests, et cetera, so get the buy-in of the business, 
Now, when I do, I just have to click the box to actually deploy to production and just watch as the application gets deployed. So that should have actually triggered the build. If I go back to applications here, come on, there we go. Okay, the application now gets deployed. Now, one thing that I want you to realize is that the same package that I use and deployed into staging, I'm using that same exact package into production, which means that I'm limiting the changes that I'm doing from staging to production. The second thing is that I actually deployed just as easily, if you notice the version change right here, I noticed it, I deployed in production as easily as I deployed in staging. So deploying on a cluster is as easy as deploying on a single server. So just so that you see really quickly, I'm in production here, I'm load balanced. So notice here that the web server that I hit changes with every hit that I make. Okay, so if I go into the admin and I log in really quickly to show you, whoops. Oops. <laughs> okay, there we go. So um, you, you see I have my code change in uh, my production environment as well. So it's, it's, all, it's all good, it's all working. Now, uh, actually let's go back to the admin. Now let's assume that, why is this happening? Okay, let's assume that I actually, uh, this version didn't work out the way that I expected it to work, that there was actually a problem and that I wanna roll back. So it's as simple as actually just clicking one button, roll back, and my application rollback is initiated on all my servers, and you see I switched back, I reverted back to 1.0.13, and if I go back into my admin, hopefully I'm still logged in, the code change is gone, all right? So one click, I log back, I roll back the application from where it was, from the code change that I made to the initial version that I had because I just realized that there was an error. Now, one last thing that I want to demonstrate to you, uh, actually two last things. Um, the, in, in, in production, the interesting thing about the cloud is that you can automate infrastructure, okay? So infrastructure automation. When you need more servers, when you've got too much load on your cluster, you need more servers, you can add them dynamically. So normally there would be some kind of metric uh, on the servers that is monitored that says I have too much load, I need more nodes. I'm going to actually script this through Chef and simulate that and uh, just, go ahead and show you how I can join two nodes really, really easily. So, whoops, or not. Oh, no, STDY is not STDY, that's fine. Um, I can go back into my servers view right here, and you see actually by the time that it took me to uh, go into the console, the servers were already being joined. So I'm joining dynamically two servers. Now notice what's happening here. I'm joining the servers into the cluster. All the configuration of PHP is actually being transferred, Okay, and the applications that are on the cluster are being deployed to those two nodes automatically just by joining. So you don't have anything else to do other than join the nodes. Set up your chef script or your puppet script or your infrastructure automation scripts to actually join the nodes to the cluster. Now, uh, we're almost done here, so we're online. I can just go back to my production environment and hit a few times, and hopefully I'm gonna, at one point, hit the standby node. It's gonna happen, it will happen. It will happen. <laughs> okay, so you know what? I, you know, I, I'm not going to keep hitting this, but I can do. Uh, I can show you directly that the node is actually online. There we go. Okay, so I just hit the node directly. I'm not going through the whole event. It's the same effect. All right. Last but not least, um, application uh, management. Okay, so Intent Server, as you saw really quickly when I logged in, I've got a very detailed. Actually, let's go into production. It has probably more data. Um, you have a very extensive uh, monitoring system. So we monitor certain trends and metrics. I'm not gonna go through them in detail because that's not really what the demo is about. But, uh, and we also very importantly monitor from the PHP engine itself, from within the PHP engine itself. So we have some rules that we set up that you can monitor certain metrics and certain functions in the PHP in the Zend engine and get those monitoring, this monitoring data back. Now, in and by itself, this is quite interesting, but if you're a sysadmin, you don't like to look at different screens and switch between different monitoring systems, right? You want everything in a single pane of glass, green, everything's good, red, I got a problem, I need to talk to someone, okay? So what we did with the Zen patterns is that we created some integrations into different systems, right? And that's all that I showed you today, basically. Chef is one, uh, Jenkins is one, uh, and uh, what happens to be one as well is uh, Nagios. So I'm going to go into my Nagios uh, system right now. And 
you see how beautiful the Navius interface is. Uh, Andy, thanks for moving my mouse, by the way. Uh, and I'm going to go into services. <laughs> and if you look at this right here, this data that you see from here is actually data coming back from the monitoring from Zen Server. So one thing that I should have mentioned is that Zen Server is completely API enabled. Everything that you saw on Zen Server's dashboard is an API. It's a web API. And this is how I actually can do these different uh, patterns to connect these different systems by using those web APIs. So you can see here, uh, if I had a node that was down, I could yank a node, if I had some time I could have shown you, but I could yank a node and get an alert here, or when I get some monitoring information error, uh, you know, it comes up here. Uh, I also have a, um, uh, an audit uh, log where basically if anything happens on the server, an unauthorized access or anything, we log really everything, every configuration change, et cetera, so that all, we know that the servers are all consistent. You can know everything that happens on your cluster. Okay, so there you go. I showed you uh, continuous integration, release automation, infrastructure automation, and application management. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. That was uh, super cool. I love seeing uh, Maurice's demo. Uh, we're pretty much out of time, so I just wanted to, to wrap up and uh, talk about a couple of additional things. Um, we basically, Zen Server, as Maurice mentioned, is completely API enabled. It, we built it as a cloud fabric, elastically scalable, and we've actually worked with a number of cloud providers uh, to deliver it as a service through the cloud. Um, we, IBM actually decided to OEM Zen server, and today if a customer goes to IBM Smart Cloud, they actually get it um, directly. We have a partnership with Amazon, and we basically already pre-created the infrastructure automation for you. So we have an Amazon CloudFormation template. You can just do one-click launch of a cluster of Zen servers. It will scale up, scale down, and you get these kind of capabilities. And then we basically also worked on integrating this with a lot of other clouds. And really the key thing to take away from here is PHP is the only language that has a solution that is completely consistent across multiple clouds. Java doesn't have that. Um, Spring tried to do that, but then they got acquired by VMware and they stopped doing it. Microsoft, of course, doesn't do it because they're very focused on Windows Azure. So we believe that there's a huge opportunity here for the PHP community to really stand out from the crowd uh, when it comes to cloud deployments. And just to summarize, there's a lot of change happening today in every company, and companies have to move faster. We're hearing that from our customers, we're seeing it from the developers. And our focus is really to make sure that we enable that change of architecture, change in process, and change in infrastructure consumption. Um, by the way, on the continuous delivery side, we have a blueprint uh, document on our website. It's very generic, but if you're interested, it actually takes you through what you should be thinking about as a company if you're going through continuous delivery. Most companies, by the way, don't get there overnight, so you're not expected to go and implement this within a week. Sometimes it also requires some changes in the organization. But it is a good blueprint that can actually help you think through this. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, I do want to say a special thank you for Matthew and Maurice. Uh, we were here for ZenCon and they agreed to stay an extra day uh, to come to a FOOP and uh, do these demos. Thanks a lot, guys. And I uh, hope you all enjoy uh, the rest of a FOOP. <laughs>